Um, I think most of us here aspire to doing the impossible and to pushing the limits. Our speakers now have done that. Uh, I covered aerospace for about 15 years, and I can say what both these men have done is really remarkable. Bertrand Picard in 1999 got in a capsule attached to a balloon and went around the world nonstop. It took him about three weeks, uh, broke all kinds of records. Last year, he turned around and did it again, this time with a few stops, but in a solar-powered electric airplane called Solar Impulse. Again, breaking all kinds of records and showing what's technically possible. He's now trying to find a thousand profitable ways to deal with climate change. Bertrand Picard. Achieving the first solar flight around the world. This is the story of two men. Bertrand Picard, psychiatrist and explorer. And André Boschberg, engineer and entrepreneur. A team driven by a vision of the future and a passion for innovation. And the first airplane of perpetual endurance, able to fly day and night without fuel. Together with their partners, they wanted to show the power of pioneering spirit and clean technologies to bring solutions for a better world. Solar Impulse, the adventure showing that change is possible. In, uh, in 1999, when uh, Bertrand was going around the world in a balloon, Airbus was kind of a punchline of a joke for everything that was wrong with Europe. Under Tom Ender's leadership, Airbus today is a focused, profitable, visionary company, uh, one of the, the true European and global tech pioneers. Uh, Tom, when I was covering Airbus in those days, I would have said that was impossible. So, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Enders. Gentlemen, it's almost like we live in the future because we have video calls when we want them, we can manufacture at home with 3D printing, but we still have to deal with traffic. You know, you still have to sit in a car. When, you know, what is the path to being able to fly over cities, to get around that and do it cleanly? Bertrand, what's the, what's the vision here? You know, when I started with Solar Impulse, the goal was not so much about aviation, the goal was to be clean. The goal was to have a way of flying perpetually with no fuel, stay in the air as long as you want. And because aviation has been a symbol of innovation, aviation has changed the world, innovation makes people dream, people are enthusiastic when they see something flying, I thought the best way to promote clean technologies was aviation. And uh, 15 years ago, the world of aviation looked at me like if I was completely crazy. Maybe because Tom Anders was not yet in his position. <laughs> 
Today, we show that it's possible. Solar impulse has flown around the world with no fuel, with a pilot on board. And it's clear that the next step now is to push it to aviation. But it will only be possible, in my mind, if it is clean. Because if you extrapolate air traffic of today to air traffic above cities, everywhere, landing on top of skyscrapers, transporting people from, like, like in a taxi, with fuel, with pollution, with noise, and with CO2, you will have a lot of opposition, even if it's possible. So I think what is today a fantastic demonstration to the world is that the next step of air transportation will only happen if it is clean, if it is ecological. And maybe for the first time, you will be able to reconcile ecology and economy. Tom, technically, in, in the world of aviation, how close are we to something like that vision? I think we are very close to it. I remember when I was here last year at DLD, I presented some first ideas. By the way, Hubert, I feel uh, increasingly uh, comfortable with DLD when I see satellites on the screen and uh, rockets uh, taking off here. Um, no, I mean, we're making, we're making good progress here, and what Bertrand is saying, yes, we're fully aware that when we uh, talk about uh, new forms of air mobility, uh, particularly in urban environments, they have to be clean. We have uh, last year formed a new business unit that's called the acronym being UAM, Urban Air uh, Mobility. And we're not just writing papers, <clears throat> we are developing uh, demonstrators and uh, we hope that these first demonstrators uh, will fly in the near future. Bertrand, in addition to all your flying, you're a psychiatrist. Uh, they go well together, I guess. Um, from that perspective, how do you think people will deal with the idea of flying over a city, uh, especially if in the not-too-distant future there's no pilot in the aircraft? I believe you don't have just one human psychology. You have a lot of different human psychologies. So for the pioneer, the human psychology, of course, wants to do something new, wants to push the limit further, sees the vision and wants to implement the vision. So if you ask the pioneers, yes, of course it will happen. Urban electric mobility with no pilot going everywhere. Now, unfortunately, you also have the human psychology of the regulator. And this is a completely other psychology. It's about stopping everything. It's about keeping things as they are today, not make them more complicated. So it will be a huge conflict between the forces of resistance and the forces of vision and pioneer. And today, I don't know who will win. Usually when you have two forces, you need a third one. And the third one might be the popular need or the courage of the politicians. Maybe we will find people who will promote this new type of mobility to show that their country is leading the way. So in my opinion, it will not happen in Europe or America first. It will happen in Asia and probably China. Tom, you're a, you're a helicopter pilot, so you've actually flown in environments like this. What's your sense of, you know, what does it take to turn this from a technical reality into a, a practical reality? Well, you could say helicopters today are already a tool of urban air mobility, but exactly for the reasons that Bertrand has mentioned. Uh, noise, particularly, uh, pollution, uh, safety, uh, they are not allowed to, to, uh, to, to fly in urban environments in a, in a great number. That has to change. As with respect to uh, psychology and, and pilots, I remember very well when we launched our latest uh, long-range uh, Airbus aircraft some 10 years ago, one of, the, one of the CEOs of one of the largest uh, European airline company was, was asking me, but Tom, can you construe it in a way where we need only one pilot, please? Well, that was 10 years ago. I mean, uh, we have certainly made uh, progress, but I think um, if people look at the, um, uh, the accident rates, which are very, very low, are decreasing, but the 90% of the accidents or more is human errors. 
you look at the, 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 the strikes uh, that airlines uh, produce, particularly in this country um, recently, you could think that, that passengers are more susceptible to unmanned flying if we can demonstrate that it is safer, as you say, but always safer than uh, uh, with pilots. It's a painful thing to say for a great pilot like Bertrand, for a private pilot uh, like me, but this uh, clearly is the trend. Bertrand, you mentioned regulators. You know, you, you've flown around the world multiple times, dealt with regulators in many countries. What's your sense on, you know, okay, even if we can do this technically, can you talk a little bit more about the regulatory challenge here? The regulator will give you the permission only if the problem will not fall on him. That's the basis. So if you manage to have an endorsement from a head of state, then the regulator will eat in your hand. If you don't, the regulator will be an obstacle. So you always need the endorsement. You always need to create enthusiasm, to, to create relation with as many people as you can. And for the flight around the world of Solar Impulse, the technology was easier than the overflight permissions, very clearly. And uh, Gregory Blatt, who is uh, in the room here somewhere, he was full time just to open the way to get airport permissions, landing permissions, and, and, and so on. Uh, but as soon as we got the head of state, then it was easy. So we have to, to look for very, very high endorsement. I, I'm, I'm sure it's what you're doing also. Absolutely. <clears throat> that all, absolutely. And I think uh, I would like to introduce another thought. When we talk about urban air mobility, um, we should not just think of the traditional authorities, the FAAs and the ASAs. Uh, we should think about transportation departments uh, of, uh, of counties, of, of cities because urban air mobility only makes sense in the long term if it's an integral part of a seamless way of, of transporting people. Well, look, many years ago, what is it, 100 years ago, uh, transportation, uh, in addition to the traditional on-the-ground transportation, went underground. Now, I think, we have all the technological wherewithals to go above ground, i.e. to really utilize the third dimension. It would be outrightly stupid not to utilize the technologies that are available today, starting with artificial intelligence, uh, Satya was talking about it, or artificial general intelligence, whatever you call it, autonomy, new sense and avoid uh, uh, possibilities, navigation, nanotechnology, so new materials, etc machine learning, all that comes together and fuses, and I'm absolutely sure aviation will benefit. As a matter of fact, we'll create a kind of a third revolution in aviation uh, after the very invention 100 years ago, the 40s and 50s, that when saw jet propulsion, i.e. going to speed and um, supersonic, and now with the new means and technologies and processes, I think we can create a third revolution in aeronautics and space. And especially because if you continue to think about human psychology, you also have the dream and the imagination of the normal human being. And they want to continue to see something new happening. And in aviation, I think it's really the symbol of it. Uh, but in the beginning, it's difficult. You know, I, I, I was in Dayton with Audrey Borschberg, my, my partner, uh, last year. And in the Museum of the Wright Brothers, there is a code from 1905 from the official authorities of the city. And it was said, we hope that these two young men will start to look for a serious job instead of losing their time with stupid and useless tools or toys. So, so you see, this is how people were considering aviation in 1905. Today, we will most certainly see codes of this type but we should not listen to them. By the way, I can compliment that by a quote one of the Wright brothers said in 1908 or 1909 that intercontinental travel between New York and Paris would never be possible because technology would not support an engine running that long to make that, that distance. So even the great visionaries sometimes get it wrong. So, Tom, what, what are some of the projects going on now that are going to enable this? What is the, the, the state of the art here? Well, first of all, I think we are uh, seriously 
the, the only big OEM uh, aviation or aircraft manufacturer who takes, this, um, who takes this challenge on seriously. It has a lot to do with the fact that we are uh, the world's largest commercial helicopter manufacturer. And we certainly see the possibility or even a threat if we ignore these developments to be gradually push out of the business or at least important segments of the business. So we are, as I say, we're not just writing concepts, we are building demonstrators, we are in this, um, in this process. Uh, one particular disruptive uh, project is uh, continuing in the Silicon Valley where we hope to be able to fly a demonstrator, an unpiloted demonstrator um, for a transport vehicle. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year already, but again, this is not something we will um, manufacture next year or, or uh, a few years later. It's just a, a demonstrator, and it's important to have these discussions with the authorities, but it's also important to, to show real, uh, real vehicles and uh, operate them in, uh, in airspace under certain regulations to gain experience. So we are in an experimentation phase. But we take this uh, development very, very serious, and we're increasingly investing a lot of money. I, I should mention here, particularly in, in, in Munich, we have uh, um, agreed with Siemens uh, to do a very important uh, joint activity here in Munich, uh, a e-aircraft systems house, where both companies will invest in the next five years a triple-digit million amount of money. So that demonstrates that we are serious. Uh, to show until 2020 that uh, electric aircraft or hybrid aircraft, i.e. with thermal propulsion and electric propulsion, are feasible. And I know about your predictions, Bertrand, uh, in, uh, I think the clock is now nine, nine years or something. Nine years and seven months. Nine years and... Because uh, uh, I said since five months. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I think it was for 50, uh, for 50 uh, passengers. Uh, we're thinking that in 15 years we can, we can do 90 to 100 passengers with an electric or hybrid aircraft. This is not yet an intercontinental range aircraft, this is not an A380 uh, or something like that, but uh, it's good progress. And we're betting, of course, in the meantime, that we're making further progress in terms of uh, technology, particularly energy density in the, the batteries that we need. Bertrand, can, can you talk a bit about electric aircraft? I mean, it wasn't that long ago electric cars we're still a dream. Uh, what is the technical, the, the technical state of the art for electric aircraft? Yes, if you <clears throat> take one kilo of kerosene, it gives the same energy than 36 kilos of lithium batteries. So if you look at the data like this, you will believe electric aviation will never happen unless a huge, huge improvement to the batteries. But when you understand that the combustion engine has less than 30% of efficiency and the engines of solar impulse electric are 97% efficient, three times better, when you look at the weight of electric engines that are so much lighter, when you see that you need no tanks, no pipes, no tubes, you, you start to be much closer than before between batteries and kerosene. And this is why I believe that if you take, in f less than 10 years, a medium-haul airplane with batteries, you can make short-haul flights with 50 passengers. So, Tom, I'm so happy when you said even 100, because it means you're going much faster than, than I thought. But it, it will happen <clears throat> because we don't have to think in making the airplane of today electric. We need to think out of the box. It needs to be a lighter airplane, different shape, different aerodynamic. And just remember, it's not the people who are selling candles who invented the light bulb. It was other people. And this is why we have to think electric aviation in a completely different way to make it happen. If the, if the cars, the electric cars, came so late on the market, it's because it was normal car manufacturers who made electric cars. When Elon Musk arrived, he was not a car manufacturer. He came from the world of internet. So he first put a screen, and then he built the car around it. And this was a revolution. So if we can think with this pioneering spirit, electric aviation will come very, very quickly. And what I admire with you, Tom, is that you are in the business, but you are also a pioneer. 
And I think this is why you will succeed when a lot of other airplane companies will fail. Very flattering, thank you very much. <clears throat> but let me, let me add one thing, because he's talking uh, about solar impulse, and that was really a, a fantastic project. Uh, we are building solar aircraft as well. We, we have currently a solar aircraft even under contract with the government <clears throat> that flies uh, something like 70,000 feet high, um, has a wingspan of 25 meters, can stay aloft for two weeks uh, without uh, refueling, and we think we can bring it to months to stay there. And the whole thing with 25 meters wingspan weighs 30 kilograms. Uh, of course, without pilot. We, we, we both uh, regret that uh, at all. Um, but, but it shows what is possible also on the solar side. And I think we will see also kind of a fusion in the future between solar, where solar brings advantages, uh, for instance, through energy harvesting also on aircraft or combined with electric aircraft, um, and then electric and uh, partially we will also need for many years to come, not to sound over-enthusiastic, thermal propulsion. This is why we are thinking in terms of regional aircraft, more of a hybrid uh, solution, i.e. thermal propulsion plus electric propulsion and hopefully also, also solar elements for energy harvesting uh, on the aircraft, on the aircraft fuselage. Tom, you're also a very big player in, in uh, drones, UAV, um, and air authorities are having trouble incorporating them into commercial airspace. How do you see the prospect for things flying around cities? Do you see the, the I mean, you touched on this before, but um, technically, how difficult is this going to be? And say, compared to um, self-driving cars? Well, I think I'm, I'm not the only one uh, or the first one saying that, that um, autonomous flying uh, is easier than autonomous driving. Um, and I think more and more people uh, realize that. Nevertheless, it might well be that autonomous driving or partially autonomous driving is uh, implemented first. But we see already companies. I mean, Uber has done a big, stu uh, big uh, study, a white paper on uh, urban air mobility. Uh, automotive companies are, are, are thinking about it. I think it's, it's coming. As I said, regulation, yes, we need to engage. We are engaging with regulators. But we must think also about different authorities. Um, city transportation departments are a very important one to see how we can indeed uh, construct a seamless um, infrastructure for transportation. Keep one thing in mind. Air mobility has a huge advantage. I mean, we're pouring billions and billions every year, every country. I think it's a, at least a double-digit billion number for the European Union each year in urban infrastructure. Now, with flying, you don't need to pour billions into concrete roads and bridges, uh, etc. It's easily scalable. And basically, you have an infinite number of corridors, or almost infinite number of corridors which you could use. If you pour money into the more or less digital infrastructure that you need for urban air mobility, a fraction of the cost that we need to maintain and expand our road networks and rail networks uh, can be utilized for uh, uh, air mobility. Bertrand, maybe a, a last question. This is going to be a tough sell if it's only for the rich. So how does it get democratized? I mean, Satya was talking about democratizing AI. How do we democratize uh, urban air mobility? Electric will be cheaper than oil. That's for sure. So I think it will be democratized just because of the cost. And uh, when you have an electric helicopter, it's cheaper to build and cheaper to maintain than the gasoline helicopter. So I think this is not, this is not a problem. It, it will happen. Uh, my colleague, André Borchberg, is also working on that. Uh, he's the man of the industry. I'm not a man of the industry. So what I want to do is not necessarily to bring these type of things on the market. There are specialists for that, like Tom. Uh, what I want to do now is to use the result of solar impulse, the credible results of flying with no fuel around the world, in order to continue to promote clean technologies in every field, not only for, for aviation, because today we are in a real problem with climate change and pollution. We're in a real problem with fossil energy. And we need to be more energy efficient in every field, in aviation, but everywhere. 
So my goal today is to continue building and creating the World Alliance for Clean Technologies with the goal of bringing 1,000 profitable and efficient solutions within two years to help the governments to reach their targets in terms of environmental goals. So a part of it will come from aviation or will go to aviation. But don't forget that aviation is a very, very small part of the problem. It's 3% of energy consumption. It's 5% of CO2 uh, contribution to climate change because of the altitude. But 95% is on the ground. So we need to focus also a lot on making the grounds cleaner and not only aviation. So that's where I'm working now on. The electric air bus. The urban mobility. Thank you.